Hello, this is Chewing the Gristle, and this is the day before our national election. Please go vote. Hi, Tim. Brother Al, how you doing? I'm, I'm good. And our poet today is Kim Bloom Highclack. How are you, Kim? I'm great. How are you guys? Wonderful. Kim's poetry comes from the sights and sounds and emotions of living in small towns, one in Ohio where she was raised and one in South Carolina where she lives. Her first book of poetry, In the Garden of Life and Death, A Mother and Daughter Walk, Main Street Rag Publishing, chronicles a 13-year period as a mother whose daughter battles cancer twice, then as a daughter as her mother is diagnosed with cancer. Her poetry has appeared in Catfish Stew, Pettigrew Review, Iodine and Cacalac, as well as other journals and collections, and she is a Pushcart nominee. Kim helps organize and MCs, except for right now we're on a COVID uh, vacation, a monthly reading and open mic afternoon of poetry and prose in Rock Hill. She also coordinates two, has coordinated a Fraxic um, poetry events through the Lancaster County Council of Arts. Last year, Kim helped choose Rock Hill's Poet Laureate, and uh, and it was uh, it was it was their inaugural Poet Laureate, who we actually interviewed earlier this year. Okay. She is also the co-editor of Cacalac. And uh, if you are in the Southeast, uh, there will be an announcement for folks to, to please uh, submit. In addition to poetry, Kim has, a, has had uh, creative nonfiction published and one of her published short stories won first place in the Moonshine Review. Her latest project is uh, researching, compiling, and writing the centennial history for her par parish. She blogs at a writer's window, wordpress.com. Welcome, Kim. Hi, glad to be here. It's a yeah. nice sunny day, so it's a good day to be out here. Oh, yes. It's been, the weather is really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Our, our first question, or my first question, will be about your poetry journey and who your teachers and, and your influences were at the beginning and, and throughout your journey. Um, I actually wrote my first poem when I was in fifth grade, uh, the summer between <laughs> fourth and fifth grade. And don't a lot of us start out that early? Um, and that's probably the only one that I memorize and can still say. Um, but I had two, I had a really great teacher in fifth grade who validated what I did, um, Fred Kirsch. And I had left my poems in a school library book and that they, they were able to find me and give them back to me. And he pulled me aside and told me that he thought it was great that I was writing poetry and just really supported that. Um, then when I was in high school, I had two high school English teachers. Dave Sproul uh, was my freshman English teacher. And we had to do that poetry notebook that everybody does in high school. And the theme that I chose was children. And um, I got a good grade on it. But he and his wife had just had their first baby or their only child. And he asked me if he could have a copy of that book to give to his wife. Um, as a gift, which was so, um, so affirming. And then my other high school teacher, um, Marilyn Stepro, and she encouraged me to enter some contests. So all along, um, and then when I, um, when my book was, um, came out and I did my book signings, I went back home to Ohio, had a book signing up there, and David and Marilyn were both there. And that just, um, you know, it, it just meant so much that they would come back and, and be there with me. Um, and now I've had such great mentors, um, Joseph Bethanti. I did a week of study with Joseph. Um, I did two weeks with Kathy Smith Bowers. 
Both of them had been poet laureates from North Carolina. So really good, supportive um, mentors that give back to the poetry community. And then uh, Philip Shabazz is another one that I studied with. So all along, I've just had some, I've just been very fortunate and very blessed to be with some people who, um, that really draw things out of the poet. Wonderful. Tim. Hey, Kim, how would you describe your poetry style? <laughs> um, I laugh because when my book came out, um, someone came up to me and they were just so excited and they said, I love your poetry because it's not deep. And as soon as, <laughs> yeah, and as soon as she said it, she realized that wasn't the compliment she was going for. Um, she says, no, I understand it. And I think accessible is, um, is part of my poetry. It, I talk about small town. I talk about the things out in the garden. I talk about life in general, but it's poetry that resonates with people and they can, it's accessible. Um, and I think that has, that has helped in a lot of ways. Would you say it's more lyric or narrative? Oh, gosh. Um, can it be both? Yes. Because, yes. Um, because well, in, in, in the, my book, um, it tells a story. It tells the story. It's not chopped up. It's a chronological story. And that's one of the one things that um, Joseph, when I studied with him, I studied with um, Kathy Smith Bowers first, and her her thing is, you go for the abiding image, and you write from that abiding image. And Joseph was movement, so I'm getting the lyrical from Kathy, and then I'm getting the movement or the narrative from Joseph. So I think it was that combination of the two. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense to me. You know. Good. Just, yeah. It works so, for me, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, hope it, I hope it, you know, resonates with people who read it. That's that's wonderful. And so, so, what for you? What makes a good point? Oh, an image um, where it hits me in my heart. Um, you know, when I'm co-editing the the cat what are the what are the things that that I look for or make a good point to me? the sound of the words, if there's a, an interesting twist or an, a surprise in a phrasing, those kinds of things. So what advice, uh, as it put your editor's hat on a bit, okay. uh, would you give uh, to the emerging poet about submission, about um, sending their work off, maybe about getting their first rejection? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I thought about that because having been on both sides of that of that book, I've been a submitter and rejected, I've been and a contributor, and I had been the editor, and um, not to give up, to submit, 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 because even if you're rejected, you can't take that personally, and I know that's really, really hard to do, but with Cacalac, and it's not just Southeast, um, it's you can submit that from we we had um, I think eleven or thirteen different states uh, this last issue, but we had four four hundred submissions, and we can only take a hundred or so, you know. And so just logistically, we couldn't take all four hundred poems. Plus, it's a journal of art as well, and so we had almost seventy pieces of art submission submitted. So there's just no way we can take everybody. And so when you submit something and get rejected, you can't take it personally. It's just, you know, if we've taken 10 poems and you were number 11, that's, you know, that's just the way it goes, unfortunately. Um, so there's some real logistical parts in there. So don't give up, continue to submit. And if one poem continues to be rejected, then you may want to look at that. But um, give it some life first before you pull it back and say, okay, something's not working here. You have any advice about formulating a cover letter or what should be in a cover letter? Oh gosh, um, they always say make it sound like your writing so that your personality comes through. And I would think that would be one of the first things is you know that all of your credits and all of your publishing and those kinds of things 
um, make sure that those are in but toward the end of a cover letter. But I like to see the person's personality first. You know, is this someone who you know, has a good sense of humor or you know, doesn't use really big words when small ones could fit that kind of thing? Well, can we hear a couple poems from you, Kim? Sure. Um, the first one, Reliquary. In the antique shop, rusty tools, tattered books, display cases with military pins and campaign buttons, ESO signs and heavy glass insulators bury a polished wooden box with hinged lid. I open and smell cherry pipe tobacco and smoke. Here, Grandpa scrape the pipe's burgundy bowl. Scritch, scritch, scritch. A hollow clink of wood against glass. Black tar shavings fall into an ashtray. He opens the box of moist, sweet-smelling leaves. My mouth waters for want of a taste. He pinches a fingerful, fills, tamps, lights, draws, then releases, draws and releases, draws, releases. Tobacco glows red with each draw, dies with each Smoke puffs through mustached lips. I curl into his lap, breathe deep, and hold. Wonderful. Prune cake. We stand at the counter in a kitchen just big enough for the two of us. I pump the piston for chopping nuts, and Mom cuts prunes into small bits, mixes cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves into flour. Tiny specks of burnt orange and burnt sienna belie the powerful exotic aromas. Buttermilk, rich and creamy, clings to the side of the empty measuring cup. Mom pours a half glass for herself, drinks it down like sweet cream. While the cake bakes to golden brown, she stirs butter, buttermilk, and Cairo syrup over medium heat drops a bead into ice water and waits for small ball stage. Pours the honey-colored glaze onto hot cake. I hear it seep and drizzle down, watch it crystallize along the edge of the pan. Once cooled, she slices green and red maraschino cherries as holly leaves and berries to decorate one corner. I scrape and roll the drippings of buttermilk icing into sweet, soft caramels. Nice memory. Thanks. Revision, revision, revision. <laughs> what do you have to say about revision? And when when is a poem done? I'm one of those, I love revision. I, I know there are those that just, and I had a friend once that said, what comes out is golden and I don't want to be touched by it. Um, I love revision because there are too many words that you can choose from to be set to settle on that first choice. Sometimes it works and sometimes, you know, um, you can find something better just because the musicality of the word, um, the number of beats in the word, how it fits with everything else. So, um, I, all my revision, or I shouldn't say all of it, the last piece of religion, revision comes on the computer when I can cut and paste. Um, I just, I've got my thesaurus with me and I like um, looking at old words that might have a new resonance to something. So um, when it gets, when I know it's finished, I don't know that I ever know it's finished for sure. There are times when you write and then you look at it and you've gone about three lines too long and you go back and you chop those off and there's that there's that final image or sound that you want to end on. Um, and I think critique groups help. They're, um, they're very good with sort of finding those little pieces where you sort of don't hear all the time. But I, I enjoy revision. 
I do you have it. critique groups that you participate with? I do. I have um, I have three. One is my, and we're not, we're meeting virtually. Um, one is my Thursday Night Poets that have been meeting um, various um, personalities or, or, or um, participants for probably, gosh, 15 years, maybe close to 15 years. Um, then I have a Jabberwock group that's over in Charlotte. And then my, um, my poet sisters, there are four of us that studied with Joseph Bethanti for a week. And we just really hit it off. We were um, soul sisters from the very, very beginning. And two of them are in North Carolina, one's in Tennessee, excuse me, and I'm here. And we will always share, um, you know, online. And then this is the first year um, that we've not met for a Poet Sisters retreat where we get together for um, three or four days. And we go and we work. Um, we each bring a number of prompts and we work prompts. And when we finish, we have eight to 12 new poems started. So um, I, I, think, I think it's important to have another group of writers that you feed off of that understand how a writer's mind works and um, how the creative mind works. So. Who are you reading now that really stirs your imagination and your poetry juices? I just finished Ted Kuser's uh, latest Red Stilts. And he's, he is one that I just really resonate with because he and Mary Oliver and um, Wendell Berry, they just make me want to go out and dig in the dirt. They just get me connected to that, that very natural thing. But I started reading um, Natasha Trethewey this week because I want to sort of expand my, my, my diversity with reading. And um, her book, Domestic Workers, I think is the title of it, is the one that I just picked up and started reading this week. So I'm looking forward to that. Hmm. Okay. Can you share a couple more poems with us? Of course I can. Um, this one, and I, I'll try and show the photo of it. Um, you may not know Steve McCurry. Is the name familiar? He's a photographer. And uh, I'm sure you've seen um, Afghan Girl from the National Geographic. Okay, he had an exhibit. And I was um, invited to do an ekphrastic poetry on one of his paintings or one of his photos. And this is it. Diaspora. Prayer flags, squares of blue, white, red, green, or yellow, hang like laundry on lines, crisscrossing, zigzagging up rugged Himalayan gorges, each color an element, sky, wind, fire, water, or earth, hung with a Buddhist intonations and mantras for wisdom or to appease elemental gods. Thrones rest on Kang Rimpok, sister to Everest, their valley footstools set higher than lesser mountains. Prayers drift down ridges, lamas chants quieting as snow to blanket the world. A century-old tradition until Chinese warriors cross and zigzag over Himalayan passes, smashing sacred idols, burning strings of flags. Prayers windswept as ash, scattering a people. Out of the rubble of ancient monasteries rise new flags, strength and cloth, despite destruction of stone. Prayers call to refugees and pilgrims, peace, compassion, patience, return. Tibet's topography and history written in ridges and valleys on the face of a benevolent Buddhist monk. Mm. Bones. And the word becomes flesh, bubbling deep in the marrow, cell lathers upon cell, foaming into tissue forming syllables upon syllables until guttural sounds link into chains and we speak. Connect, DNA binding us into tribes, a people, a culture. Motherlands carry across waves of water and air, aficionado, mayacopa, bon voyage, 
pierogi, strudel, tamale, and sponge bread. Mother tongues paint, whisper the images that conjure, control, convey, love, hate, words to mislead and twist the truth, calm the soul, or spew the venom, slice the heart or massage and manipulate the spine, the flesh, the stories. We tell and retell, release the memories of our ancestors locked in old black and whites. Generations will know the marrow in their bones was not formed by dust, but created through exhaling breath. Delightful. Tim, let's dig into your craft a little bit. Okay. And talk about the poetic elements you tend to use, you want to use, and, let's, and maybe mention the ones you avoid. Um, obviously, you avoid the cliches, and so that's always kind of fun to kind of figure out, okay, what, what's the new twist on things? Um, I like color. I like the sound of words. Um, and I think before, the musicality, how there's this rhythm, and I don't, you know, the beats, I don't get locked into, okay, I had a panitor or anything specific. It's when I read it and how does it sound to my ear? Um, I look at art. I, I'm out in the garden. I, I, I usually, um, I, read, I, I write on my deck. So I'm out there with the sounds. Um, one of the poems that I've written, the, the, uh, the prompt was rain. And I wanted the poem to sound like a summer rainstorm. And so it, I sat out there and listened to a rainstorm and how the thunder built. And, and so that was part of what came into the poem too. Um, color, and again, again, the abiding image, the, um, what, what I want people to resonate with when they're finished. And, I, and when I'm working out a poem, um, I will even mention or write in there what is the tone or what is the emotion that I want the reader to, that I want to put in there, whether the reader gets that emotion or not, that's up to them, but what I'm going for. And so I actually journal all of this stuff out before I actually write the poem. Um, you know, where do I want this poem to go? So, do you, you know, I know you briefly mentioned this, but do you do much research? All, all the time, all the time, and I can get lost in that. Um, and even with, with the book, it all centers around garden kinds of images and metaphor, and I was researching different kinds of weeds and different kinds of those kinds of things so that I could get the right word. And I think a lot of people don't realize that when you're writing poetry, I mean, they, they assume that you re do research when you're doing fiction. I don't know that people assume poets research when they write poetry. And I always do. I always have my dictionary, my uh, thesaurus, my, I don't use the laptop or a computer right away, but I'll make notes. Okay, where do I want to go with this? Because I can't stop and do that. I have to be writing freehand, but I will go back and I'll research. Um, well, even for the, um, the one about the, um, the Tibetan monk, um, I had this great image, but I didn't know all of the history of that Himalayan and the, the llamas and that kind of thing. So definitely do research. Well, Kim, I, I, I love asking people about the rituals they have about writing, <laughs> right? Because we all have yeah. little quirks. I mean, are you a morning writer? Are you a, a night writer? Do you write during the afternoon? Do you, do you write in a, in a journal? Um, you know, talk about this, you know, how you do it, how you get comfortable uh, and become um sort of focused to what you're doing what you're trying to craft well the short answer would be yes to all of that i write in the morning and at night and, and so yeah um but i do i have my this is my this is what i use it's it, and it's not even a journal it's an artist book so it's all blank pages and that way i can do whatever i need to do with it um it has to be a very fine point pen or um, a mechanical pencil, something very, very fine. And my, I always talk about I settle into it. 
I settle into, and I wake up in the morning and I do, um, I do yoga and some other kinds of, of ritual types of physical and spiritual things. And then it's like I had to put other, I had to quiet the noise of the dishwasher and the ironing or the laundry that needs to be done. And then I settle into it. And, um, and for a poem, I will just, I will journal whether it's the prompt has been an image or a phrase or something that I'm working on. I settle into it. And then I will journal, where does this take me? What other things, and a lot of times, um, and I'm sure other poets find the same thing, that you start off with this kernel and it takes you to a poem that's way completely different. But I can't get there until I've journaled through that. And um, and I'm not a, a coffee drinker, but in the wintertime, I'll have my tea. And during the, now it's water. So, um, you know, and, and sometimes I'll use music just sort of as background noise, but a lot of time it's just being outside in nature and listening to the birds. And um, that to me is is part of the ritual as well. But I'll wake up in, at four o'clock in the morning and go downstairs and write. Um, and and I have friends that will laugh at me now because I actually start using notes on my on my phone where before it was all had to be on the paper, but now I'm saying, okay, I can do that. And they just think it's funny that I'm, I've joined the digital age and put notes in my phone. <laughs> so, you know, it, I came in cooking and screaming, but I'm now doing little notes. If I hear a phrase when I'm outside, um, if out in the world, or if I see something, then I'll jot something down in my phone and, you know, poem prompts and come back to it. So, take, you know, given all of the r rituals and the, and the things you do to make yourself comfortable, what advice would you give to the emerging poet? about having a writing practice? Um, first, read. I think that's really important. And, um, and not necessarily reading the well-known poets like the Mary Olivers. Um, there are an awful lot of small presses that put out really great books like Main Street Reg and Jakar and is it Muddy Ford that yours yes, is? Muddy Ford. Yeah. Um, they have great collections of poetry by men and women and people of color. Um, so read. Um, you can't go to open mics right now, but when we can open again, do open mics so that you are listening to the poets that are being read. And then um, for your own poetry, find that quiet spot. And I don't mean someplace that's devoid of noise, but that quiet spot in here whether you know you can be at a coffee shop or out in your yard or in the park and there are things going around but finding that quiet spot in here that you can um explore whatever it is that you want to be writing about hey brother al i think i've talked long enough <laughs> Go ahead. yeah uh, my uh my actually my last question would be uh Often folks have a resource that either helps guide them or they go to occasionally as a writing resource. Do you have uh, resource uh, books that you use for a resource? Mm, all the time. Um, again, I use a lot of art books, and I know you can't see them on my bookshelf back here, but um, art books. I love art books to look at um, different kinds of um, images. And then also there are all kinds of books of prompts um, that just get your, your mind going. Um, and I can give you a list of those for later. But um, one of my favorites is, and I just finished rereading it, the Poetry Home Repair Manual by Ted, um, yeah, by Ted Kuzer. And I love it because he basically says, you know, these are the rules, but you know, if you don't want those, then, you know, you're allowed to sort of not follow those rules sometimes. Uh, Mary Oliver has one. And so there are all of these kinds of different prompt books that, um, that I go to for resources in addition to um, the books of poetry themselves. Hmm. Yeah, that's, okay. that's fabulous advice. Um, when struggling to write, when you're experiencing a block, 
what should a poet do? Um, me as a poet, I go out and dig in the dirt. Um, I garden. And when I'm doing something that doesn't require a lot of um, thought, I can do what I, what I call my monkey work. Um, it sort of frees the brain a little bit. And so me, for me, that helps to get out and get away from it and do something that's sort of not mind numbing, but mind freeing. Um, so for me, it's going out and working in the dark. Some people go for a walk. Some people put on music. Um, something that sort of gets you out of that loop of I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. And what's the next word? Move away from it. And then um, nine times out of 10, you come back and something has spoken to you while you're away from it a little bit. So that's what I do. Let me ask you um, if you could tell, um, remind people what you're working on now. Uh, remind our listeners what you're doing now and, and what's the best way to get hold of your book? Um, I'm actually just starting back on my poetry. The, um, the book for the church is finished. And yay, <laughs> that was four years of research and, um, and work. And so um, I, I'm just coming back. I've got four manuscripts of poetry that I, not that I've forgotten, but I've sort of rediscovered. And so um, I'm excited about getting back to these four books of man, or these four manuscripts of poetry. And my book, which is In the Garden of Life and Death, can be found at Main Street Ray Publishing. Um, or you can go to my blog and um, connect with me, and I still have a few of these that I can send to people. Would you bless us by reading uh, two more poems? I will, and I will uh, read these out of my book. And one of the things that um, people have said, like I have mentioned, it's a narrative. It goes from point A to point B, um, not just chronologically, but people have said, you bring us to hell and you bring us back or you take us to hell and you bring us back. So it's actually, even though it's about cancer, there is a hopefulness to it. So these two poems sort of show both sides of that. A bitter little pill. How can such a tiny pill make you so hungry? Your brother remembers the nights before when you demanded, more beans, mom, more chicken, mom. This time you're old enough to reheat spaghetti Pour milk on cereal, scavenge our cupboard of anything that tempers your insatiable appetite. But the pill that makes you ravenous ignites bouts of rage. The heat releases through your fists, my arms and chest their target. Let me go. Yet in the next breath scream, no, don't leave me. Clinging to my neck, you wrap your legs around my waist in your need to anchor. Your brother tucks a pillow between us, softens the blows and absorbs our tears. We sit for long minutes as you thrash between emotions you're too young to understand. And we wait until your storm passes and all you hunger for is the chicken in the fridge. Christmas cookies. Mm. Zachary pops the blue delft tin of Danish butter cookies. Tissue paper cups. Russell as he sets them on the tablecloth spread on the kitchen floor, where it's easier to huddle and work. Lack of an oven won't keep my five-year-old from decorating cookies for Santa. He squeezes tiny tubes of blue, red, green, and pink icing, leaves dots and squiggles in abstract patterns, faces, and shapes. One sheet finished he puts aside to dry, an assembly line of cookies as efficient as Santa's elves for toys. Christmas carols play in the background. Jingle all the way. Slap, thud, ting. Slap, thud, ting. Gabriel smacks each decorated treat, bouncing the tin and smearing the icing. The cookie sticks to her palm. I helping, Zaka. I helping. She nods in all seriousness, drops the cookie and aims for the next. Her assembly line and rhythm matches her brothers. Mom, shock, frustration, anger, the ingredients for a talk about two-year-old sisters, five-year-old brothers. We add a measure of laughter and he continues. I taste the joy of an explanation 
that didn't begin because her chemo Mm. Yeah, it pulls at you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our interview with Kim Bloom Highclack, uh, a poet and an editor and a friend. It may be months yet before we we have the opportunity to to meet in person at open mics and and other venues. But uh, we really, both Tim and I, appreciate that you took part of your day to, to talk with us about poetry. And again, I encourage our readers to buy her book because <laughs> yeah. we appreciate that. As poets, we appreciate when people buy our books. And the book is In the Garden of Life and Death. A Mother and Daughter Walk. It's at Main Street Rag. Yeah. Thank you, Kim Bloom Highclack. Thank you, guys. It's good to see you and, and meet you, Tim. And um, hope you have a good day. And everybody else out there, too. <laughs>